I would like to welcome everyone to today's event, this webinar on understanding inequalities in children's offending and justice journey. This has been um, an exciting project that I've been watching from afar for a couple of years, and I'm really excited to hear these um, presentations today too. About the event, the, the aims of today's event is to provide insights into children's offending and their justice system contact from these three major longitudinal data sets we have um, on this project. The first is the Edinburgh study of youth transitions um, and crime. The second is the Growing Up in Scotland study. And the third is an Australian data set called the Queensland Cross-Sector Research Collaboration. Another aim of the project is to explore how different aspects of inequality impact on children's behaviour and their long-term justice journeys. The audience for today's event is very varied and we're really extremely pleased to have people here. It is aimed at policymakers and practitioners um, with an interest in childhood inequalities, transitions in offending and impacts of system contact on young people's trajectories. And it offers this opportunity to hear these, this new evidence and discuss how this could inform current and future development of strategy, policy and organisational practice. And we invite a discussion towards the end about future data and research needs to extend our knowledge of these issues. So the running order for today's event is that I will be introducing three presentations, um, which will last 15 minutes each. After the three presentations, I'll introduce the speakers um, at the time of the presentations. After the three presentations, we will have a session where we invite three respondents to respond to what they have heard. And today we're delighted to have as respondents Colin Convery, who's Chief Inspector for Safer Communities with Police Scotland. We have Liz Murdoch, the Youth Justice Team Leader of the Scottish Government. And we have Maria Galli, the Legal Officer for Children and Young People's Commissioner Scotland. So really, um, people embedded in, in child and youth justice will be the dis respondents and discussants on the presentations that they hear. This will be followed by a Q&A session where we open it up to everyone to ask questions. As Isabella has already outlined, you can ask us questions via the chat function throughout. Um, we will store these until the end, or you can raise your hand in the usual way at the end. And as Susan says, uh, sorry, as Isabella says, please do turn on your audio and video when you wish to answer any questions or ask any questions towards the end. The coming up next to introduce the project Understand Inequalities is Professor Susan McVee. Susan McVee is Chair of the Quantitative Criminology in the University of Edinburgh School of Law and she is co-director of the Edinburgh Study of Youth Transitions and Crime and director of the whole Understanding Inequalities project where she leads a programme of research on crime and justice and inequalities over the life course. The work that her team of researchers has undertaken includes analysis of the economic, social, structural and situational inequalities that impact on the risk of victimisation, offending and criminal conviction. And it is with that um, introduction that I would like to welcome Susan to come and take the chair. That's lovely. Thank you very much, Morag. And uh, can I just welcome everyone to the webinar today uh, myself? Uh, it's a small but exclusive event uh, and rather than hosting something quite large and unwieldy which is, has become the norm in the current climate we did want to focus on generating some more detailed discussion amongst a group of practitioners policymakers, and experts in the area of children and their behaviors so that was one of the reasons that we've we've kept um, today's audience quite small and very select um, as more like said we're going to be presenting on a, a range of papers that have been developed under the um, ESRC funded Understanding Inequalities project or UI project. Um, the study began in 2017 and its aim was to examine multi-dimensional and multi-spatial inequalities across a range of different topic areas um, using data sets that were already available and ready for research. So we've not generated any new data over the course of the last three or four years. It's all been data that was existing already. 
Um, the work has involved a team of around 30 researchers over more than 10 research organisations in the UK and Europe and the US and has focused on two main streams of research, one of which was intended to explore the influence of space and place and geography on inequalities, for example, how changing patterns of poverty within cities have impacted differentially on um, certain groups. And second stream of work focused on stability and change in inequalities over the life course. And it's that second strand of research you're going to be hearing a bit more about today. Um, in terms of data, I thought it was just worth noting Scotland is a very data rich country compared to many others. And in social science terms, we have a series of very large cross sectional studies, you know, the health study, the household study and the crime and justice survey that allows us to monitor quite a wide variety of different aspects of the Scottish population. And these surveys are really valuable and um, really rich but they don't tell us very much of anything about children and young people. So we have to look for other sources on that. Uh, and Scotland is lucky to have two large longitudinal studies which have enabled researchers to look at the lives of children and how different aspects of poverty and inequality impact on their lives over time, particularly from a justice perspective. Uh, so the Edinburgh study of youth transitions in crime, which Morag mentioned, um, is a large longitudinal study with a cohort of over 4,000 young people um, who started secondary school back in 1998. Uh, it's collected a lot of information, uh, both self-reported data and also linking that to survey, that survey data to administrative records from schools and social work and children's hearings. Um, and today you're going to hear about some of the findings from that very rich data source. And while it doesn't reflect the lives of children today, which are arguably quite different. Um, so, for example, technology happened since we did the Edinburgh study. I think it does reflect the children of the early devolution years who are now, of course, um, in our many of you know, who are in our adult systems. Um, Scotland also has the Growing Up in Scotland study, uh, a new cohort of children, uh, this one nationally representative, around the same size as the Edinburgh study, but much broader in scope. And Gus has provided some really valuable information to support policy making about children and young people in Scotland over the last few years. Um, at the age of 12, the Gus study included a bank of questions on offending behaviour that were taken from the Edinburgh study, which means that we've been able to study the behaviour of a new cohort of, of people um, and compare it with the cohort previously. So 20 years apart, we're able to, to look at offending behaviour. So you'll also hear findings from that study over the course of the event. Um, and finally, just to say that large longitudinal studies um, uh, such as the Edinburgh study and Gus are very costly and very time intensive and it's unlikely that there will ever be more than a few of them on the go at any one time especially as we head into a kind of strange new world in the post-Covid era and I think that's where administrative data comes into its own. Scotland has been playing a leading role in the development of a national data safe haven, a safe and secure environment that allows research using administrative data in ways that benefit the public. Um, unfortunately, it is taking a long time to get data on children and young people into that infrastructure, as I'm sure Morag will attest. Um, and also, there's currently no justice data being shared in the Scottish Data Safe Haven. However, today you're going to hear about some research using administrative data from another jurisdiction, from Queensland and Australia, which actually has the same size population as Scotland. Um, and uh, you, you'll hear some uh, work that's been bringing together administrative data which is allowing us to, to look at um, young people's journeys to different systems. So I hope you're going to enjoy the event and find plenty of emulation to uh, stimulate your minds and raise questions for discussion. Um, there is still a bit of scope to influence the next phase of work that will be undertaken by the UI project in terms of um, the next piece of research um, around children, young people and inequalities. So I will be listening out uh, for ideas on that. Thanks very much. Thanks, Susan. Um, I'd like to now to introduce the first presentation, which is called Inequality and Offending, Exploring the Drivers of Child Offending Using the Growing Up in Scotland. And this is by Dr. Kath Murray and Dr. Babak Shahan Shahi. And Kath and Babak are researchers on the Understanding Inequalities Project. Kath has worked on a range of cr criminal justice projects and published widely on the police use of stop and search. And Babak is an applied economist who uses advanced statistical methods to address policy issues across a wide range of fields, which include education, 
and crime. So without further ado, I'm going to invite Babak and Kath to present their presentation. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Morag. So um, Babak and I are going to talk about our work on childhood offending and inequality. And we're going to look here at two related projects, both of which use the longitudinal Growing Up in Scotland or GUS data set that is collected by Scotsen. The data set's ideal for us because Scotsen recently introduced a suite of questions on parent and child offending. It's the first time this type of representative data has been collected in Scotland since the Edinburgh study of youth transitions and crime, um, which was actually used as the template for the GUS um, questions. So our first project looks at adverse childhood experiences or ACEs and how these interact with poverty to um, affect the risk of offending in children. The second project looked at the transmission of offending behaviour from parents to children. So this is the idea that crime runs in families. So for each one we'll run through the key ideas and findings and, and comment on the policy implications. Okay so Starting with ACEs, um, I'm sure you're most, uh, most of you will be familiar with this agenda. Okay, so in recent years, we've seen a lot of work on the links between ACEs and various negative outcomes. And the focus here tends to be very much on families and individuals. Okay, and separately, we know that poverty is a risk factor for childhood offending, with children from poorer households and living in um, deprived areas at higher risk. So in this project we're interested in if and how ACEs and deprivation interact in relation to child offending okay, and we're also interested in different ACE types given this is an umbrella concept it takes in a wide range of experiences. And what we show is that there, there appear to be complex interactions at um, play here. So the ACEs agenda originated in the field of public health and the original study by Felitti used 10 questions to calculate a simple adversity score and this was based on recollection of childhood events and these broadly covered abuse, neglect and household dysfunction. Felitti found a strong relationship between the number of ACEs experienced and various negative health outcomes and since then the concept has been applied in other policy areas including criminal justice. Now the ACEs agenda has attracted criticism. Okay, the tech list is um, seen as deterministic and overpredictive. Very different experiences are given equal weighting. A co-author of the original study has cautioned that the approach is relatively crude. Um, in particular, critics have highlighted the repackaging of poverty and inequality as ACEs. And this is more AG's work I'm drawing on here. This is the attribution of structural problems to families and individuals. So in policy terms, one of the challenges here is to disentangle the respective effects of ACEs and poverty as to better right, uh, direct resources. So our aim was to establish whether ACEs predict offending, I beg your pardon, I no <laughs> I'm going to pass over to, I'm getting carried away here and I'm going to pass over to Babak. Sure. So our aim was to establish whether ACEs predict offending in the context of growing up in poverty and if so, whether looking at different types of adversity is more helpful than a simple count. The children in our analysis are age 12 and the sample is around 2,500 use a simple binary outcome measure based on whether a child reported at least one of nine types of offending in the last year. For example, uh, shoplifting, assault, knife carrying. Uh, around a quarter of children reported at least one offense, the most common of which was hitting, punching and kicking reported by 15%. And the data is analyzed using a series of regression models. Well, our ACE measures are based on 13 type, uh, types of events experienced between the age of 7 and 12. Our first measure is binary, whether or not a child has experienced three or more ACEs, which applied to 14% of children. We then identified four thematic ACE groups. These are parental maltreatment, household dysfunction, family trauma, and family offending. And the idea here is to identify the impact of different types of experience. 
our household deprivation measure, measure is based on the number of suites that parents are, were unemployed and or in the lowest income quintile. Likewise, neighborhood deprivation is based on the number of sweeps that a family lived in the most deprived SIMD quintile. We also include control variables, but will only present the significant results here. Our results are structured uh, as a series of four models. We start with ACEs only, and then uh, and then we add uh, other factors into the models. Model one shows that without any other factors, having more ACEs between the ages seven and 12 is strongly and positively related to offending at age 12. However, in model two, when we add deprivation, neither ACEs nor the poverty measures are independently significant. Model three tests whether the risk of offending is greater amongst those with more ACEs when also growing up in poverty. Here, the ACEs measure is significant, but weaker, and the poverty measures are not significant. The final model tests for all these relationships. In brief, this shows that having more ACEs increases the risk of offending, but there is no obvious inequality amongst those from poorer background. Boys are at greater risk, as we would expect, and poor general health is a risk factor. What is not clear, given the simple ACE measure, is whether some experiences are more important than others. To address this, we replicated the analysis using four ACE groups. Model five shows that of these, these four analyses, parental maltreatment, uh, sorry, these four uh, ACE groups, parental maltreatment is by far the most significant risk factor. This was also the case when we add deprivation in model six. Model seven tests how the ACE group interact with deprivation. And here there is an important shift with neighborhood deprivation now significant as a main effect. This is also true in model eight in which both parental maltreatment and neighborhood deprivation are significant. Okay, um, so to pick up, pick up from Babak, overall then, our results suggest that having more ACEs can play a significant role in explaining childhood offending, but that we need to consider different types of experiences. And here in the research, parent, parental maltreatment comes through as particularly important. So this is clearly relevant to lockdown, um, where some children will have faced either long periods of time in difficult home environments or putting themselves at risk by breaking rules. The results also reinforce the links between offending and poverty in this case at a neighbourhood level. In terms of policy interventions, this uh, taken together potentially points to universal services for children who experience mal parental maltreatment and initiatives to address the adverse effects of living in deprived areas. Okay, so we're now going to move on to our second project which looks at the intergenerational transmission of offending. And this again, this is the idea that crime runs in families. As before, we're also interested in ACEs and deprivation as well as contemporaneous family risk factors. Now, it is well established that uh, parental offending is a risk factor for offending and children. Again, there's a range of theories um, as to how this happens. A good deal of this work falls under the umbrella of social learning theory. For example, a propensity to offending can be picked up through parental attitudes and values, the types of behaviours that are rewarded or punished or through observation. We also know from child psychology and development that both the quality of child-parent relations and levels of parental supervision are risk factors here. Added to this, as we've already seen, deprivation and childhood adversity are also relevant. Okay, so a key policy question in this context is what matters more? Is it past behaviour, more recent circumstances, or a combination of the both? Uh, now, Within criminology, most research on the transmission of offending has um, focused on fathers. The evidence base on maternal offending and how this is affects children is much smaller. And this most likely affects an assumption that female offending is less important. And it, it is true that women offend less frequently and their crimes are typically less serious compared to men. But it remains that women do offend and given their gendered role as 
primary caregivers, mothers are expected um, likely to exert a, a strong influence on their children. Um, that there are established sex differences in offending also raises the question as to whether transmission effects um, impact on boys and girls differently. And here the ev existing evidence um, is inconclusive. You're on mute, Babak. <laughs> Sorry, it happens in this webinar. <laughs> so our aim was to investigate the transmission of maternal offending and how this affects boys and girls. GOS is ideally placed to explore this as nearly all the adult respondents are mothers. As before, we ran a series of regression models, this time disaggregated by sex testing for boys and girls separately. We use the same outcome measure as before, which is child offending at age 12. Our main independent factor is maternal offending. This is a binary measure based on mothers having reported at least one of six offending types, no matter how, no matter how long ago. 16% of mothers reported at least one type. Most offending was low level and non-violent with shoplifting most common at 13%. And the average age of the systems was 17. So this is capturing low level teenage offending that, uh, that most people grow out of. We also tested for the quality of parent-child relationship and parental supervision, whether parents know where their child is, who they are with, and so on. As before, we are interested in ACEs and deprivation, and we also use the same control variables. Table three show, uh, shows our results for boys and girls side by side, and we can see that the effect of maternal offending is experienced very differently. In model one, the impact of maternal offending is larger and stronger for girls compared to boys. In model two, poor parent-child relationships act as a strong predictor of offending in both girls and boys. Model three adds parental supervision. This is not significant for girls. For boys, however, there is a significant positive effect which also knocks out maternal offending. In other words, current family functioning appears to have a far stronger impact on boys than any legacy effect of maternal offending. Model four introduces our ACEs and deprivation variables, all of which are non-significant for both boys and girls. Lastly, model five, when we add the controls, household deprivation is significant for boys only, along with child health and cognitive ability. Okay, um, so to sum up, there is strong evidence here to support the transmission of offending from mothers to daughters. Um, however, when taking account of contemporaneous family function, what's happening in the present, there's no evidence to suggest the transmission from mothers to sons. Okay, uh, parent-child relationships are the only common risk factor between uh, boys and girls in the analysis. It's also striking, we thought, that there's a much wider range of risk, risk factors that predict offending in vulnerable boys. So here we have child health, cognitive ability, parental supervision, parental maltreatment, and household deprivation. None of these factors are significant for girls. So looking then finally to the policy implications, um, there's a case here, we think, for general parenting initiatives that highlight the association between prior maternal offending and the risk um, of offending in daughters, the importance of good parental supervision in boys, so this is being consistent, not overly, overly harsh or punitive, and of good parent-child relationships for, for both boys and girls. The link between offending in boys and household deprivation, again, it reinforces the relationship between offending and structural inequality, that which we saw in the, um, the first paper. And again, this we think underscores that ongoing need for policy measures that lift families out of um, poverty. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you so much, Babak and Kath, that is just really fascinating stuff and it's so interesting to get the, the most latest data, most up-to-date analysis of that data and it's definitely going to give us something to think about. I would encourage the audience to put your questions if you have any at the present time 
in the chat function or you can store them up until the end. And next I'd like to reintroduce Susan McVie, who's going to give us a presentation on the relative impact of structural, systemic and social inequalities on young people's offending and criminal conviction outcomes. Over to Susan. Thanks very much, Morag, and thank you for sharing the slides, Isabella. Um, I'm going to, the paper I'm going to present, um, you have to bear in mind it's using different data to the data that, that Kath and Babak have presented, and also I'm moving on a stage, so where they're looking at very much in childhood up to age 12, I'm taking things a step further and looking at data into adolescence and then into early adulthood, and I'm looking at the, the relative impact of structural, systemic and social inequality, so three different factors which I'll explain as I go through. So in terms of background, uh, we know that there's been a big drop in the prevalence of youth offending uh, and actually the, the comparing the Edinburgh study cohort at age 12 to the growing up in Scotland cohort at age 12 shows that prevalence of offending uh, declined from 71% to 30%, so that's a very, very large drop. But we can also see in our youth justice population data, uh, so for example, if we look at um, the, the number of young people affaired on offending grounds to the children's hearing system, uh, the number of 16, 17 year olds uh, coming into court system, uh, the number of under 21s coming into the prison system, there's been big drops across all of those over the last uh, decade or so. Uh, but we also see there's a concentration effect uh, particularly in our youth justice population. Although the numbers have got smaller, we're actually seeing a higher concentration of more deprived, vulnerable and disadvantaged young people um, and much more complex needs within our uh, justice population too. Now we have, a, there's, a, there's a raft of different kind of policy agendas focused on poverty and social justice um, and I've picked out kind of three main areas of Scottish Government policy which I think tap in to some of the uh, difficulties faced by children from more deprived backgrounds. First of all, the kind of very large policy uh, agenda around um, child poverty, which includes um, the Child Poverty Act and the Child Poverty Delivery Plan, which is part of this kind of bigger United Fader Scotland action plan, um, which is, is attempting to kind of level the playing field and tap into some of these um, underlying inequalities. We've also seen, uh, particularly over the last uh, decade, uh, a shift away from some of the more punitive uh, responses we saw to young people in the early uh, devolution years, um, and also the kind of a shift away from more interventionist responses towards diversion uh, uh, to kind of lower level uh, forms of intervention. And we see that through the Getting It Right for Every Child um, at whole systems and early and effective intervention uh, policies. And then more recently, we've seen a greater awareness of negative impact of childhood adversity and trauma, which Kath and Babak already talked about. Um, and in the policy sphere, that can be seen through uh, expansion of the National Trauma Training Programme, uh, trauma-informed practice, which we are seeing routinely in, in policing and, and introduced in prisons, um, and also ACE awareness training. So we know we do have policies in place that are attempting to kind of deal with some of these issues. Um, but what do we already know? We know that children who grow up in poverty are more likely to be involved in offending, particularly long-term offending, uh, and we know children growing up in poverty are more likely to have justice system contact, again, particularly long-term criminal careers. And one of the reasons for that kind of long-term justice system contact is that we do still have labelling processes and certain cultural practices within institutions that does shape who gets involved in our formal systems um, and who doesn't. Uh, and particularly those young people growing up in poverty um, who become known to systems at an early age are more likely to end up being kind of labelled and, and introduced into those, um, impacted through those cultural practices. And then we know that um, young people who do get caught up in the justice system also tend to have a higher than average number of adverse childhood experiences and that's particularly been seen in the prison system where there's been a lot of research on that in recent years. There's been a bit less research, the, the, the findings around the link between ACEs and offending behaviour is a bit more equivocal across the, the literature. Um, but we do, we, we do see all of these things within the Scottish system um, and then we have these policy responses which do tend to deal separately with these different issues. 
So the research questions that we have were to look at the relative and the combined impact of poverty, systemic intervention and adversity during childhood, so that's up to the age of 12, on patterns of offending during adolescence, um, so that's the, the phase between age 13 and 17, and also how all of those things, how these kind of early risk factors and patterns of offending during adolescence then impact on patterns of criminal conviction in early adulthood. And then that kind of more broad question about how we should respond to that um, in terms of policy. Uh, so I'm using data from the Edinburgh study of youth transitions and crime. I'm not going to go into this in any detail. I'm happy to answer any questions about it, but it's a very large study collecting data over a long period of time. Um, and I'm particularly looking at data up to age uh, 25, uh, although we're currently in the field at age 34 collecting more data. Uh, this is a snapshot of the data we've collected so far. So you can see it's a mixture of self-report survey data, but also uh, linked to formal administrative records from schools and police and social work and children's hearings. And I'm focusing here mostly on the self-completion data and some of the formal data from criminal conviction records and social work and children's hearings. So in terms of the method, we developed uh, two forms of developmental trajectories, which I'm not going to go into any detail about how we did that. But essentially, this allows us to disentangle typical pathways. Um, in this case, we looked at people's self-reported serious offending behaviour. So serious offending includes things like housebreaking and robbery and carrying weapons and things. So we, we stripped out a lot of the low level um, offending behaviour. And we looked at kind of typical patterns of behaviour over the age of 13 to 17. And we did a, a similar, uh, we used a similar method to look at patterns of criminal conviction from age 13 to age 24. And what we're trying to, um, understand by modelling these pathways is how does some of the things that people experience in childhood up to the age of 12 impact on these later offending patterns and criminal conviction patterns. Uh, and we've got measures of uh, the number of ACEs, uh, we've got a measure of poverty which is based on three different uh, measures of, of poverty or deprivation, we've got a measure of formal system contact which looks at contact with agencies around offending behaviour, which includes uh, school exclusion, uh, children's hearings contact and um, uh, police uh, warnings and charges. And we've got a measure of whether they were involved in, whether they reported involvement in serious offending um, under the age of 13. So we're controlling for their behaviour at an earlier age in trying to explain the patterns of behaviour in the teenage years. And um, because we know sex is quite an important uh, factor when it comes to understanding patterns of offending and uh, criminal convictions, we've controlled for that too. So this is what our uh, trajectories or typical pathways in terms of serious offending look like. Uh, the vast majority, well actually just over half of the cohort members are in the grey line at the very bottom which shows the non-offenders. Um, so just under half were in one of the serious offending pathways and you can see there's four of those and they distinguish themselves from each other uh, in terms of whether they are low or high. That's based on the frequency of their offending. So you can see we've got a persistent low and a persistent high pathway and uh, another two distinguish themselves in terms of being kind of time limited. So we had kind of higher levels of um, offending or higher frequency of serious offending um, in the kind of early teenage years and then that declines over time uh, and one of those is higher than the other. So we've got a teen limited high and low uh, pathway and a persistent high and low pathway for self-reported offending. Um, We've then, in terms of our criminal conviction pathways, uh, see a completely different picture, but remember this is looking at a different time frame up to age 24. Most people are in the green line at the bottom, so those are people that weren't convicted at all or maybe had the odd one conviction here or there. Um, a small group of people were in this very early onset chronic group of conviction, so they had a high likelihood of being convicted right from their early teenage years and that remained high um, up to their early 20s. 
Uh, we then got uh, two groups of people who had a, a kind of rising risk of conviction during the mid to late teenage years, but then one plateaued and declined and the other one kept going. Um, and we've got a yellow line which shows a, a group of people who tended to only be convicted once they got into their kind of late teens and early 20s. So you can see very distinct pathways. And I, I won't have time to go into these in any detail, but part of the purpose of this is to kind of explore why some individuals ended up on different pathways. Very quickly, the descriptive analysis of our series of ending classes shows here that all you need to know is uh, if you look down the left hand side, it goes from non offenders at the top down to persistent high serious offenders at the bottom. And you can see as their offending got higher and more persistent, um, then they were more likely to be male, they were more likely to have a higher level of poverty, they were more likely to have ACEs, and they were more likely to have um, early system contact. So there is a relationship between offending and um, all of these things. Uh, and you can also see it in the criminal conviction analysis at very descriptive level. You can see that the more chronic their criminal convictions were, the more likely they were to be male, to have experienced poverty in childhood, to have more ACEs and to have um, early system contact. So there is a relationship um, between these things for both offending and criminal conviction. So well, this was done in two models, and the first model is looking at their predicted um, self-reported offending trajectories or pathways, and I've included a little picture there just to remind you what those were. Um, and here we can see that boys were more likely to be uh, involved in offending in each of those kind of four groups um, rather than not offending um, across all of them, um, and their, their risk of offending compared to girls uh, was higher, particularly for the teen limited high and persistent high serious offending. We also find that those who were involved in offending during childhood up to the age of 12 were also more likely to be uh, involved in one of the teenage pathways and again particularly the two high level um, serious offending pathways. If we then look at the ACEs, uh, poverty and early system contact, we also find that all of those also uh, were independently uh, predictive of involvement in offending. So if they had more ACEs, they were more likely to be offenders across any of those pathways. If they were growing up in poverty and if they had early system contact, they were also more likely uh, to be offenders across all of those pathways. We also find some interesting uh, sex interactions. So boys who had uh, more ACEs were particularly likely to end up in the persistent um, high serious offending class. In other words, there was an incremental degree of inequality for boys with more ACEs in terms of the risk of being at that highest level of offending. And we find a negative interaction effect for um, uh, sex and poverty, which means that um, girls growing up in poverty were more likely than boys growing up in poverty to end up in these kind of um, three lower level um, serious offending classes. Uh, we didn't find the same effect for the high level serious persistent class. But in other words, there's a kind of incremental effect of poverty um, on girls in terms of increasing their risk, uh, their in inequality of involvement in offending. So what does that tell us? Um, it tells us that inequality and exposure to structural disadvantage and ch adverse childhood experiences and early system contact are all independent predictors of offending. Boys are more likely to engage in serious offending in adolescence, which we would have known anyway, but particularly that persistent and high level serious offending. Um, however, girls who are exposed to structural disadvantage are at a kind of enhanced or increased risk of involvement in serious offending um, across all types except the most persistent. And boys exposed to adverse childhood experiences are at increased risk of being in that more persistent serious offending class. So there are some interesting sex differences there. In the second model, we look to predict criminal conviction trajectories. And this time we're looking at exactly the same measures again to predict people's involvement in criminal conviction. But in addition to that, we're going to control for uh, individual pathways of serious offending. 
What we can see here is that um, even when we control for adolescent offending and the, the relative difference in terms of seriousness of offending, boys um, are still more likely to end up um, with a criminal conviction. Um, in the first three categories, um, there wasn't a significant effect with the third, the early chronic group, uh, which is quite small. We see that early offending doesn't really play very much of a role. So if offending behaviour up to age 12 doesn't play much of an impact on criminal conviction once you take account of people's adolescent offending. However, it does significantly impact on people's adolescent offending. Sorry, I'll just go back one. Uh, we can also see here that um, early poverty um, is, it has an incremental effect of uh, in introducing someone to a criminal conviction as well as early system contact. Now remember that, that those two things are, are also being measured through the offending behaviour. So this is an incremental effect um, of early poverty and early system contact in terms of some, increasing someone's likelihood of being uh, involved in one of the criminal conviction pathways with particular emphasis on that early chronic uh, pathway there. Whereas early uh, ACEs don't have any additional effect on someone's criminal conviction. Um, so it has an impact on their offending, which may then bring them into contact with the criminal justice system. But over and above that, it doesn't have a, an in incremental effect. And then if we look at their offending behaviour, I'll not go into this in any detail, but basically there is a kind of expected relationship between someone's offending behaviour in adolescence and their criminal conviction pattern. So you can see that those there's more significant findings for the teen limited high and persistent high serious offending group. So what does that mean? Um, it tells us that serious offending pathways in adolescence do have a significant impact on someone's criminal conviction pathways in expected and predictable ways. So in other words, you know, the more seriously they're offending in adolescence, the more likely they are to have a criminal conviction um, and particularly a kind of high level pathway um, over time. But even so, early childhood experiences still have a long lasting incremental effect on people's likelihood of ending up in the criminal justice system. And it's inequality and exposure to structural disadvantage or poverty and early system contact that has a particularly strong impact on criminal conviction patterns, but not ACEs. Um, and the effect of male is, is moderate across all the conviction classes, but that's also a kind of um, incremental effect. What does it mean for policy? Well, um, early experience of trauma and poverty and system contact do have profound effects on people over the life course in both direct and indirect ways. Sometimes those ways are hidden. Policy responses certainly need to take more of a multi-dimensional framework, which is integrated, holistic and takes a long term view both at the individual, but also of their neighbourhood and their systemic contact. And I think the current policy responses, to be fair, are certainly a step in the right direction. The Poverty Action Plan, the trauma-informed practice and the whole systems approach are definitely, you know, potential to have the, sh the potential for that multidimensional framework. I think the question for me is, are they all working together, together effectively in a holistic way? Um, I think we also recognise that girls and boys might have different needs and vulnerabilities within offending and criminal justice contact, but you know, is that also being um, dealt with effectively through policy? And finally, uh, coming back to a point I made at the beginning of the in my introduction, do are we confident that we've got sufficient or appropriate data to support policy decision making in this really important area as we move forward, particularly in the COVID post-COVID context? Okay, that's me. Thanks, Morag. Thanks so much, Susan. That's really fascinating insight from a, a study over several decades, giving us things such as the experiences of structural inequalities and system contact and ACEs and, and the sex differences, which I think are, are really keen. Um, hopefully we'll come back and pick these up in the questions. Um, but moving on, we our third and final presentation is by Ben Matthews, and it is um, the Childhood System Intervention to Adult Criminal Conviction, and Ben's investigating the sex and Indigenous status inequalities in the Queensland administrative data. So over to you, Ben. Thank you very much, Morag. Um, sorry, so uh, this work uh, I've been doing with Susan Mitby, as well as colleagues Carleen Thompson and Anna Stewart, who are based at Griffith University uh, in Brisbane, Australia. So the, the big question kind of underpinning this 
particular piece of work uh, is how do childhood experiences uh, affect adult convictions histories? And we had sort of two aspects that we wanted to investigate here. Uh, the first was the idea um, that childhood experiences affect adult convictions cumulatively. Um, in particular, we were drawing on the work of Susan Baidawi, who has discussed the effects of um, uh, crossover children or having crossover status in childhood, children who are in contact with both youth justice and child protection, and the particular difficulties that those children face, and uh, in particular emphasising the negative outcomes that those children have, um, both in terms of youth justice but also uh, adult justice. And second, um, we expect uh, from sort of criminological theory that the way that childhood experiences shape adult outcomes may vary intersectionally. Um, so in this case, we're looking at the uh, effects of sex and race slash ethnicity. So in the Queensland context, particularly, we're looking at indigenous status. So we're interested in um, the relationships between youth justice contact and uh, child protection contact on adult um, criminal convictions trajectories, uh, but also how these relationships vary by sex and indigenous status. So uh, it's important to, to bear in mind um, the context here. So unusually for Understanding Inequalities Project, this is um, research that we uh, were using data from Queensland, Australia. And one of the most important things to bear in mind about this context, the stark inequalities uh, experienced by indigenous people um, in Queensland and Australia as a whole. So uh, in particular here, um, the over-representation of Indigenous people in the care system and in youth justice and in adult justice, uh, which is extreme. Um, as well, these inequalities uh, are not uniform across sex. So Indigenous men uh, are particularly overrepresented in the justice system in Queensland um, and non-Indigenous women the most underrepresented or the least represented, um, whereas for uh, the child protection system, it's Indigenous women who are most overrepresented. So we have these two research questions, basically. Um, to what extent do adult criminal conviction trajectories vary by sex and Indigenous status? And are there cumulative effects of childhood system contact uh, across groups that we define by sex and Indigenous status on these adult convictions trajectories? Uh, so the data that we use comes from the Queensland Cross Sector Research Collaboration, QCRC. This is a data set that is made up of uh, linked data from different administrative departments in Queensland. So it brings together uh, data on youth justice, adult justice, and child protection, as well as um, sort of more general kind of population data from the birth registry in Queensland, as well as things like uh, the marriage registry and death registry, this kind of thing. Uh, so this is a, a data set that focuses on a small number of birth cohorts. So we focused on children who were registered as born in Queensland in uh, 1983 and 1984, and we followed them to age 29. Um, so I think some important things to note about this data set is that it is purely administrative data. I think uh, Kath and Bebek did a really good job of highlighting um, the richness of the survey data that's held in GUS and that there are lots of relevant pieces of information that we may want to know about the people in the QCRC that we don't have because it's only uh, the data that is produced through their contact with administrative systems. Um, so in particular, we have to be very careful how we understand any results uh, related to Indigenous status. Um, there are uh, Catherine Babak also emphasised the importance of structural inequalities in driving offending behaviour in their analysis. Um, we have a very thin picture of the people in this data set. So if we see as, well, as we will see, and as we would expect to see based on the context, um, higher numbers of uh, people from Indigenous backgrounds being convicted as adults, this does not imply any sort of higher level of criminality amongst the uh, Indigenous population, because we're not factoring in all these structural the other structural disadvantages faced by Indigenous communities in Australia, things like poverty, perhaps lack of access to education, um, and the history of sort of racism uh, and current racism experienced by people in Queensland. 
Um, I think that's one of the things that is so uh, nice and special about the Edinburgh study that Susan has just been talking about, that it brings together this administrative data and the survey data. Um, and it's sort of it's through the, the combination of these kind of different data resources uh, that we can sort of get a, a fuller picture of the relationship between childhood experiences and adult outcomes. One other important thing to note about the data set and the way that we have used the data here is that we um, take our uh, child protection and youth justice contact variables just as a binary yes or no, has this child had contact with youth justice? Have they had contact with child protection uh, at any point in their childhood? Uh, and the statistical methods, we basically uh, took a three-step approach. Um, so first, we uh, grouped people together based on the similarity in their adult convictions histories. So we have information on the numbers of convictions that people received in each year of age from age 18 up to age 29. And we reduced that data down into a small number of trajectories, very similar to the ones um, that Susan described in the Edinburgh study. And then we looked to see how strongly uh, see the strength of the associations between contact with youth justice and child protection and these different adult conviction trajectories and also how this association varies by sex and indigenous status and um, beneath all this is a, a regression model similar to the ones that um Babak was describing previously so on to the results and um, we have uh we estimated five adult convictions trajectories, which are uh, similar to the ones um, that Susan described. So here we have uh, a large um, class of people that didn't have any convictions or only had a single conviction, and that's about 87% of the data set. Uh, and then we have four convictions trajectories, one that starts low and then gets lower, one that starts low and then increases a little bit, another one that starts high and then um, declines pretty dramatically and another one that starts high and remains high. So these are the outcome measures that we then use uh, in to, to look at the relationships between childhood system contact uh, and this kind of summary of the people in their data sets, adult convictions trajectories. And so these are uh, all of the results basically from our model um, and I'm going to spend the, the rest of the time uh, that I have talking through this slide pretty much. Um, so here we have 16 uh, kind of cells, if you will, um, similar to the way that Susan described hers, although confusingly I flipped the order around. Within each cell we have the least serious convictions class at the bottom and the most serious convictions class at the top. In the rows we have our four sex and indigenous status groups, so indigenous men, indigenous women, non-indigenous men, non-indigenous women. And in the columns, we have our four combinations of childhood system contact. So on the left-hand side, that's children that had contact with uh, no, uh, neither youth justice nor uh, child welfare. And then children that had contact with child welfare only, then children that had contact with youth justice only, and in the final column, children that had contact um, with both systems in childhood. And so within each uh, cell, we have the estimated probability of being in each of our adult convictions trajectories for each of these 16 combinations of um, childhood experiences and sex and indigenous status. Uh, I think I basically said that thing on the left. Um, we also put up the, the difference in the estimated probability um, between having no childhood system contact and each of our combinations of child welfare contact only, youth justice contact only, and uh, both system contacts. Um, and by doing this, we can look to see the effects of having these different contacts um, compared to the situation in which there was no childhood contact for that particular combination of sex and indigenous status. Uh, and we can sort of get a sense of the cumulative effects of child welfare contact and youth justice contact just by comparing the differences in these probabilities within the rows. So I've highlighted the example on the very top row which is for indigenous men. Um, and we can see that the, the difference in estimated probability here of 0.28 um, of having of being in the high persistent convictions trajectory, uh, other conditions of contact with child welfare and youth justice is higher than the separate effects that we see for child welfare contact 
only and for youth justice contact only. Um, so this answers a second research question that there are, we do seem to have some evidence of a kind of cumulative effect and um, having contact with both systems leads to a higher estimated probability of a more serious convictions trajectory in adulthood um, than the effects of either system alone. We can also see uh, that the columns on the left hand side uh, are more different compared to each other than the columns on the right hand side. Um, so this looks at whether this, this describes the sex and indigenous status differences in adult convictions trajectories. And we see in the left hand column very extreme differences here, um, both between the between the uh, the rows in this column and um, but also within each column. So we see that in the top row, um, indigenous status men uh, have around a 55% chance of not having a conviction um, with no childhood contact, um, compared to a 97% chance for non-indigenous women. So the, the starting positions of these four groups, if I can put it that way, are very unequal. And this goes back to what I was saying before, that this is likely picking up on everything else that we haven't included in our model that goes into um, a person's chances of offending. Um, and if we compare the leftmost column to the rightmost column, we can see that the effects of uh, having contact with both of these systems somewhat equalizes these adult outcomes, but in the bad way. Uh, the adult outcomes are more similar, but, but worse for each of these four groups um, with both system contacts compared to uh, a situation where they have no contacts in, with child welfare or youth justice uh, in childhood. Um, slightly paradoxically, even though the outcomes are more similar for the four groups when they have both contacts, the, the effects of these childhood system contacts on the most serious convictions trajectories are the strongest for indigenous status men. So the numbers uh, in the top row are higher than the numbers in the bottom row. Um, I am not going to go too much into the sort of technical details of why this is, but I will pick up on that point in a second. So what has this told us? Uh, regardless of sex or indigenous status, um, people with no childhood system contact were less likely to be convicted, and if they were convicted, less likely to have a chronic and persistent pattern of convictions. Uh, childhood experiences relationships uh, with the probability of adult convictions trajectories do seem to differ by sex and indigenous status, so there are these um, differences uh, across these two demographic variables. But the cumulative effect of these childhood system contacts leads to more similar and worse outcomes by sex and indigenous status, even though it seems like um, indigenous status men have both the highest probability of conviction with no childhood contact and the strongest effect um, of uh, these two childhood system contacts on their adult convictions trajectories. Uh, the result, the reason for this result is because of the extreme inequalities in the adult outcomes that we see uh, for children with no childhood context. The, the sort of the overall equalizing effect is of, because of the, the function of the very unequal outcomes um, for children with no childhood system contacts. And this uh, very, very probability of, say, uh, non-Indigenous women being convicted in adulthood um, compared to the much higher sort of baseline probability of Indigenous men being convicted. Uh, these results are in line with um, Susan and Lucy Macari's previous work uh, that suggests that contact with formal systems themselves um, can be harmful in and of itself. And I think I uh, agree with Susan's conclusion previously that um, here in Scotland, this sort of emphasis on diversion is something that kind of is in, pretty embedded in sort of the way we see things here. Um, I was looking at the SCRA statistics yesterday um, and there's been a, a huge drop in the number of children that are being referred to the children's hearing system um, since, uh, say, sort of 2006-2007. Uh, and these results, they imply, I think, two kinds of um, responses. Uh, first, um, preventing children and young people from entering formal systems of care or justice in the first place, this diversion idea that we have talked about. Uh, I seem to be having some trouble moving the slides forward. 
Um, I think we can see your final slide, Ben. Is it the discussion slide? The second point. Uh, yes, sorry. So I think uh, it might have frozen at mine. So I've been uh, rapidly. We can see it. Um, so I now cannot see the slides, but that is okay. I think I was just better. Ah, perfect. Apologies for that. Um, yes, uh, I will briefly close, um, if that's okay. So second, for people who uh, are involved with um, both of these systems, Susan Bardari lists a number of possible sports, um, including differential youth justice services, um, uh, particular responses to things such as violence in residential care settings. And perhaps these things, as Susan suggested, if there is a, a concentration effect of the young people who are now um, involved with uh, youth justice and perhaps also child protection having a, a sort of concentration effect, a higher prevalence of um, negative things happening in their lives, that these kinds of responses may be even more important now than in the past. Uh, and finally, um, we sort of raised the question uh, that Susan also mentioned about whether the whether the right data exists uh, for people to um, be able to make the appropriate decision to support children just based on what's available in administrative systems. I think it's um it's an easy thing for me to say as a researcher because it's not my data to suggest more more data sharing. Um, but one of the one of the ideas that sort of exists in the kind of in the data linkage world is the idea that no one ever gets fired for saying no to doing more data linkage. And one of the things that we hope to sort of illustrate in this work are the, the potential costs of inaction, um, given the uh, negative outcomes for children that have contact with both systems. And I will stop there. Thank you. And apologies again for that um, weird period of silence and my computer issues. Thank you so much for that, Ben. It was really fascinating. It gives us an insight into sex differences that we had previously, but also the ethnicity, race issues too. Um, so thanks very much. I realise I didn't um, introduce Ben at the start of his presentation, and I think that's because I actually know Ben quite well, and I thought he was probably famous enough for everyone to know him. But just to um, rectify that, Ben Matthews is also a quantitative social researcher on the Understanding Inequalities Project, and he has worked extensively with Scottish convictions data to understand patterns of criminal careers and has worked on the looked after children's care placement stability and changing levels of victimisation in Scotland. So someone with a really fantastic range of quantitative experience in criminology and for children in the care system. So I'd like to again to thank all three of our or four of our presenters in the three presentations. And we come on now to this section of the webinar where we will invite three respondents to take five minutes each to comment on the information they have received, reflect on it from a position of policy and or practice, depending on their background, and offer any thoughts on what they would like to see in the future for research, what they would need to inform their practice, their policy making and their decision making. To introduce our three respondents, we have first of all, Colin Connery, who's the Chief Inspector for Safer Communities with Police Scotland. Um, Chief Inspector Colin Connery is attached to the National Safer Communities Division, and he's the lead for children and young people policy, which incorporates youth justice. Colin's also the trauma champion for Police Scotland and has led a lead role in supporting Police Scotland to become trauma informed. He has 21 years um, police service and along with his family provides respite fostering care. So again, hugely experienced in both the, um, the policing side and the looked after children side. Our second respondent is Liz Murdoch, the youth justice team leader in the Scottish Government. And Liz has been in the Scottish Government youth justice team on and off since 2009, and more recently in the last few years, has been appointed as the team leader for youth justice. Um, Liz has an interest in youth justice since completing a degree in criminology and a dissertation on the benefits of youth offending teens in England. And our third respondent is Maria Galli, who's the legal officer for the Children and Young People's Commissioner for Scotland. Maria, by um, training and background, is a human rights lawyer and currently works as a legal officer for the Children and Young People's Commissioner. She has been a solicitor for over 30 years and is dual qualified to practice in Scotland and Australia. So I'm quite interested in, in, in what her views on the final presentation and, and what that um, tells us for Scottish policy and practice. 
So without further ado, I will first of all invite Chief Inspector Colin Convery to give us his five minutes response to these presentations. Colin. Thanks, Morag. I am, this will certainly not be in the same intellectual plane as what your speakers have spoken about so, so far, but um, it will be in my understanding. Um, as you said, I'm currently uh, Chief Inspector responsible for children and young people within our Safer Communities Division and that incorporates youth justice. Um, my background is also that uh, I've worked operationally across most of the West Coast, uh, in Glasgow's East End and at various parts of Yorkshire where poverty and deprivation are, are really apparent. And I'm going to come on to that as I go through in terms of my own practical experiences. But the relevance of today um, is very striking in as much as I'm the lead for youth justice uh, within our organisation and also uh, the, the trauma lead to try and implement that across the organisation. So all that you've spoken about this morning is extremely interesting and the inputs that the speakers have given are very relevant to a lot of my work as we go forward. Um, in terms of our approach, I suppose in if you look at the policy approach within Police Scotland, we have national policy driven by uh, government and also by our own uh, national policy leads. Um, that's fairly straightforward. Um, you then get into the realms of local policing priorities and the interaction along with uh, health and social care partnerships, community planning partnerships, etc. All of which for me is extremely relevant and important in trying to tackle the aspects of poverty and deprivation and how they then lead their way into uh, offending in a particular youth offending that we're talking about this morning. And we hear the phrase frequently about a whole system approach and a public health approach to policing, and there couldn't be a more relevant time now uh, to, to be looking at that. And I think for me, the biggest factor that perhaps bring that, brings that forward is the COVID implications and the various impacts that's having, and maybe some of the vulnerabilities that it's exposing in terms of poverty, access to IT, etc., access to employment and also critically that age-old challenge of data um, and being able to access information and data. Um, and sometimes you wonder as well that the impact of the current COVID implications um, make data quite difficult and it becomes quite difficult for comparisons um, going forward. But again, a challenge to think about. Um, over the last 15, 20 years when I've been operational since I was um, pushed into the policy world, um, I can I basically can reflect on everything that everyone said this morning and you go through your, your policing journey and you probably take an awful lot for granted. Um, you certainly almost become numb or normalised to what you face every day when you're seeing poverty and you're seeing deprivation and the challenges that young people in particular face. And I think the big thing that I can reflect on is, um, is parental offending. Um, and I can remember, and it's a completely different culture now, but when I first started the the expectation was that if a, the parents of a, a child who were known offenders, it was inevitable that, that child was going to become an offender's future in life. And that is something that we're very keen, obviously, to try and break and break down. And that's, for me, where trauma comes in and is so vitally important to understand that and how we can interact. So in terms of trauma itself, um, as an organisation, I think we've made fairly significant progress in the last couple of years. Um, it has been impacted by COVID, but I think in a positive way, because it's probably slowed us down a wee bit in terms of reacting to it and be, doing it from a much better and stronger data set, but also allows us to work stronger with other partners and to deliver local solutions and opportunities, especially in route policy. But for us, there's kind of three aspects to trauma that we look at from a policing perspective. The main one is about children and young people and those who are and trying to prevent them being exposed to trauma or to try to introduce appropriate interventions to reduce the impact of trauma that they're experiencing. Clearly, that's a key focus of this morning. We also work a lot with those adults who have experienced trauma and are now living life out, displaying various vulnerabilities, which could arguably be rooted in the trauma they've experienced as children, and a lot of our activity driven through a violence reduction unit, but also through our um, various other colleagues across the organisation looking at vulnerabilities and how we can protect and prevent. And finally, of course, I look after our staff and that um, the collective trauma of dealing with other people's trauma and how we support that. But obviously our focus this morning is about children and young people. And in recent times, there's been some significant work done under the trauma brand, if you like, 
looking at a non-criminalisation pilot policy to try and reduce criminalising young people who are in care in particular. That's part of our corporate parenting plan and I certainly see that as being an opportunity going forward about how we can remove some of the stigma, um, but also how we can tackle that it's not necessarily an outcome for individuals and if we can reduce the likelihood of them being criminalised um, but still getting the appropriate interventions, which I think is a critical part. We have an officer embedded in Poland, uh, working with the, the young men within Poland, and I understand that there are obviously tensions just now and concerns, but that officer works with the men in Poland to try and encourage them and to break the circle of offending um, and to provide a different light, I suppose, to policing in terms of being a supportive role. Um, and I think fundamentally, um, detective training, um, there's a significant a portion of trauma-informed training within our more complex uh, detective training courses, and particularly in about sexual offences and supporting vulnerable witnesses. So I think take the approach that both it's both about supporting the offender, but it's also clearly about supporting uh, the victim as well. And I think sometimes that's where we have to remember and secure a balance between offending and victims and communities' expectations, but critically. For my own role, it's about preventing reoffending and supporting young people. So, in terms of youth justice, um, you'll all be fully aware of the various practices that are in place and with the new youth justice strategy and vision due to be published. And I'm, I'm pretty sure Liz will mention this in her input. There's various aspects there that we're looking at and some opportunities around about um, early and effective interventions and their practical application and how policing plays a vital role in that. We're also currently changing or looking at so they're not changing, looking at the potential change of age of referral to the reporter um, for 16 and 17 year olds to be incorporated in that. But also looking at the other disposals and interventions. And I think fundamentally it's about trying to support our operational officers to understand what the disposals are and how they can best influence these being a realistic option for agencies that are here to support young people through trauma. Um, the other aspect to be mentioned was around about legislative change. Um, and I'm quite sure Maria will touch on some of this, but clearly the, the promise, while it's not legislative, has a substantial impact on, on how we support children and young people going forward, and that will have a major impact on, on our policy and how we deliver our services. Um, I'm well aware that my colleagues, uh, Richard Cobain and his team, are online this morning from our ACRA team in the age of criminal responsibility, and I certainly know they are making some uh, pioneering steps towards introducing that legislation within uh, Police Scotland to, to deliver and support, obviously, young people. But, and I was interested, Susan, in what you had to say about um, children under 12 and the offending and how that can lead to eventualities. And clearly, that's a big part of Richard's work is looking at how we can avoid these outcomes. Um, and the last bit I, I would want to mention is uh, UNCRC and its incorporation in Scots law. Again, a, a massive piece of work which sits with my team and a huge implications for not just policing, but for public authorities across the country and probably beyond. Uh, there's no doubt that for us to influence youth justice and have an impact and prevent offending and prevent negative outcomes, we have to work together. And I think for UNCRC to be effective, there's going to be huge cross-sectoral work required to try and fix the interdependencies that exist. Uh, well, to fix them by using the interdependencies and supporting one another. It's not just going to be a policing response. It needs to be a, a policing plus SCRA, plus the fiscal service, plus court service response, and obviously social work, etc. So there's no doubt, um, when I came into this, I thought it was a relatively straightforward landscape, but there's no question that it's absolutely not. Um, there is clearly a way forward. Um, for me, it's about, and having listened to the inputs this morning, and I think back, and I, I started out most of my service early on was in North Ayrshire, on a, where we had a massive prevalence of female offending and female being imprisoned at, at Corton Vale and Greenock, it was, as it was at the time, and clearly the impacts that had. And again, that was something that I took as being normal when it was far from normal. And we've heard the impact that it has on young female offenders and that cyclical effect. So for me, it's about trying to avoid normalising po uh, poverty. It's about trying to support individuals and make sure they're getting the relevant support. And just because they're having um, trauma or offending doesn't mean a negative outcome. And there's certainly plenty we can do. But the fundamental behind all that is about working together to try and achieve the outcomes and recognising that there's so many factors that influence a young person offending in the first place.
um, least of all the fact, um, or the very fullest of fact, would be the fact that they want to do it because it's out of badness. It's usually driven by other factors and other elements that drive that. So it does sound quite simple, actually, to say that if we integrate trauma-formed approach into a public health approach, using a whole systems approach and deliver that with the legislation, it should all work, shouldn't it? But it really, it's about working together, I think. And certainly from today, um, and what I've heard this morning, I think there's real opportunities for the use a lot of the data that's been shared by the speakers and um, to inform and shape our policies going forward. Because for me, it's about how we present to operational law colleagues about why we do certain things and why it's important we do certain things. And often that's obviously informed by data and information from other sources such as yourself. So um, I thank you for the opportunity for speaking and clearly we'll take questions. Later. Thanks, Maureen. Thank you so much, Colin. That was really, really thoughtful response and, and gave me a lot to think about too and about how we have these um, shared approaches to poverty and, and trauma for children and young people. Um, on that vein, I would like to invite Liz Murdoch to respond to the presentations. Liz. Hi, thanks, Morag. Um, I just want to thank the speakers as well um, for the presentations because obviously having that data and that evidence is key for kind of policy officials um, to kind of develop policy. Um, and without that evidence and data, it's difficult to kind of know which direction of travel, you know, we need to go in. Um, so I think that is a key kind of important um, factor around having that um, rich evidence data, um, some of which we already have. Um, but I think obviously, you know, there is lots more that, that we still need to kind of gather, um, you know, over the coming years to kind of help with, with, um, with all of that. Um, so from a policy perspective, um, it's already been mentioned, but we've seen um, massive or you know, real positive uh, reductions in um, the young people involved in offending behaviour. So those that are going through the hearing system on offence grounds, um, those that are in custody and those going through the court system. I think at the moment we've got something like 19 um, under 18s currently in Poland, um, which is a, a vast reduction compared to, I think it was something like 223 in 2000, 2006. So it's a big reduction that we've, we've seen over the years. Um, and for a number of, a number of reasons um, for that reduction. Um, but what we do know, obviously, which has been pointed out, I think it was Susan that mentioned this around um, the fact that those young people that are in the system, um, you know, although the numbers are low, they have real complex needs. Um, and how do we kind of address those needs of those young people? Uh, we moved away from a kind of um, an, a kind of action kind of model to more um, the needs of young people. Um, so that's been over the last kind of 10, 15 years, a kind of abandoned kind of approach. Um, to looking at the needs of, of young people is kind of a key key policy kind of um, move and shift in emphasis around prevention um, and um, the preventative model and early intervention. And in 2011, um, we did introduce the whole system approach to offending behaviour for preventing offending behaviour by young people, uh, which is a multi-agency response um, which focuses on early intervention, prevention, and um, as we mentioned already, diversion as well. Um, it's a step in the right direction. Um, but I suppose um, one of the questions I think Susan posed was around um, whether key policy areas are kind of working together effectively. And I think youth justice is one of those areas that's certainly from policy perspective spans across so many different kind of areas. Um, and even to the point where, you know, we have two different uh, ministers um, that, that certainly my team kind of respond to. So um, that has its, it plays, it plays its own part as well. But it is, you know, now is the time more than ever. Um, you know, ministers are really um, keen to kind of move forward and progress with, um, with you know, the carrying on those reductions that we've seen. Um, so there's, there's definitely kind of more joined up work that we need to do, but we have got really good kind of communication and connection. And also externally as well, that multi-agency kind of connection and working together. Um, as Ben said, you know, there's, there's that need to, we, we can have that data, but actually how do we share that data? across all the different systems, which will be a key kind of factor um, for moving forward. Um, the other thing that's been mentioned, obviously, is around the relationship between poverty and offending and ACEs and offending. And I suppose it's just to, to point out that, um, you know, that, that point around just because somebody has multiple ACEs or just because they have they live in a deprived area doesn't automatically mean that they will go on to um, be involved in offending behaviour. Um, and I think that is that is key. Um, and I suppose how do we find out more about the reasons why people don't 
go into that um, that follow that pattern um, as well as why those that do kind of follow that pattern um, you know especially those that are coming from a similar situation um, the importance of poverty um, and ACES is obviously key for Scottish Government um, and they've been priority areas for a number of years um, we've had a number of commitments within Programme for Government um, and we, there's also the pledge, a recent pledge around supporting trauma-informed approaches, which the Scottish Government has given to, um, and also family support as well. Um, how do we kind of improve on that support so we're not taking young people out of systems uh, or placing them into systems, sorry, taking them out of family homes um, unless there's really a need to. Um, from my point of view, from a youth justice policy perspective, we had our strategy which came to an end in 2020, last year, June. Um, and we're now currently looking at a new vision and priorities for um, youth justice, which is based on the promise, which was published last year, and the asks within that very much a lot of those um, focus on children, and young people, um, and in particular young people involved in offending behaviour in my, my side of things. Um, there's also UNCRC Incorporation, which um, Colin mentioned, and I'm sure Maria will mention that as well, um, and also continuing that GERFEC approach. So um, the, the new vision and strategy that we're working on priorities will be published in June. Um, and it's very much based on feedback um, from young people themselves, uh, which we thought was key and important um, to gather that information, plus practitioners as well. Um, and that um, continues to look at um, the need for data, which obviously we've spoken about, uh, the right that rights of young people are respected, and um, the victims are supported, which is another aspect that, that Colin mentioned about the balance between victims and, and those that are seen as kind of those causing harm and, and continuing to drive the multi-agency whole system approach um, and also kind of the anomaly that we have around 16, 17 year olds um, at the moment, classed as some classes as children and some classes as adults. Um, but ultimately it's very much about um, continuing that whole system approach and trying to keep young people out of formal systems as much as possible. But going back to the, the initial point, you know, we, we need that data to kind of inform all of that policy um, uh, moving forward. So very much kind of welcome the continuation of, of all the evidence that's been gathered by um, various people. Thanks. Thank you very much, Liz. That's really a comprehensive overview of what's happening policy-wise and what needs to happen um, to, to, to get us to where we want to be for children and young people. Um, if I can invite Maria Galli now to to give us her five minutes in response to the three present presentations. Maria. Thank you very much, Morag. I think that's my video working now. Um, well, what, what a morning we've had, haven't we? Um, I would like to thank you and the organisers of today for inviting Bruce to come along and speak and apologise, unfortunately, he wasn't able to come. So you ended up with me instead. Um, I was particularly delighted at that, I have to say. Um, as everyone before me has said, and, and as I mentioned to both Colin and Liz in our chat, um, I really just need to say ditto. I think the most overwhelming um, thing that I've taken from the research and the presentations this morning has been the positive work that Scotland has undertaken over at least the last decade in terms of an understanding of the impact of inequalities per se over children and young people who are in conflict with the law and how that and uh, how the interplay between um, you know the sex dif differentials and poverty and socioeconomic differentials has on their be offending behaviour or behaviour generally. Um, I very much welcomed um, the presentation from Ben around crossover children and an understanding of what was happening within Australia. And as you mentioned, Morag, um, my experience having worked and qualified as a lawyer in Australia, working within the criminal and civil justice systems, and particularly around areas of child law, um, was, was hugely inspiring to me. Um, we can't talk about Australia without recognising the inequalities around the indigenous population particularly, but the, the same problems, the same difficulties around administration of youth justice exist there as they exist around the Western world, if I put it that way. Um, so for those of you who might not be aware, the commissioner, Bruce Adamson, is um, the commissioner for children and young people, 
um, his primary responsibility and duty and function is to hold the state to account in terms of how the state implements children and fulfills and protects and respects children's rights, human rights in policy, practice and the law across systems. So we're talking today about our youth justice system in Scotland. Um, and very fascinatingly, based on you know, all of that we've heard this morning, what is very clear is Scotland is miles ahead, miles ahead in a global sense in understanding um, the differences and the similarities that exist between the same children. We are dealing with the same children and taking an approach which is based obviously on the Cobrandon approach which we we all understand to have been pivotal in understanding Scotland as a different mechanism for um, implementing children's rights across the board which is even older than I am which is saying something um, and so the Cobrandon message has very much been part of Scotland's journey to where we are now it's actually astonishing um, so I would share everyone's very positive views on how Scotland has embraced um, their approaches and uh, using the data, which is the very skillful and welcome data from the research findings from these studies, um, to then catapult us into the next chapter. So what does that next chapter look like in terms of human rights for children? Well, we've heard a lot about the policy agenda and the development and growth around the Poverty Action Plan, GERFEC, whole systems, early intervention, diversion, trauma-informed practice, and a mental health policy is the only other area that I would add to the mix to say that the Scottish Government, and there is complete po political will within our Parliament as it exists at the moment to, to take this forward and to start to join together some of these policy um, agenda in order that rights are respected. Now, having said that, it is extremely positive, but as Susan highlighted, it's only the beginning, really. It has been a long journey thus far, and a huge pivotal milestone has obviously been, and as the others have mentioned, the incorporation of the UNCRC. In terms of international law, this is a momentous occasion for Scotland and I think is probably the most significant thing that we can look forward to when understanding the children that we have for here who need care, protection and who need to have recovery services. Particularly, Article 37 of the Convention is very clear about a child's right to recover from trauma. And I think that if we all within our practice use Article 37 and all the articles of the Convention um, to understand what a child's rights respecting system looks like, we are going a lot further than we've ever gone before in doing that. There are some, there are some negatives, there are some areas within, particularly not so much within policy, I have to agree with everyone, but certainly within the law, which will require consequential amendments to our criminal law and also to our children's hearing system and the care um, system within Scotland, building on the, the promise, building on the agenda around incorporation of the CRC and what implementation of that will actually look like. So we've engaged within our office um, in some work around identifying the, the key critical areas 16 and 17 year olds is absolutely a fundamental area of law which will require to be amended to ensure that law within Scots law is compatible with the UNCRC and there is much work as Colin identified around building on what the work that's already taken place around age of criminal responsibility as well so we have very much very many concerns around age age of a child and I think it's important for people to recognise that the Incorporation Act as it stands um, redacts part of the convention and it does this for two reasons. The first reason is that Scotland as a devolved uh, nation obviously doesn't have powers to amend UK legislation but more particularly it does that in order to achieve a maximalist approach which is very much the language of the Scottish Government in developing the terms of the bill 
um, to respecting children's rights across the rights framework. The Scottish Government's additional um, commitment as of two weeks ago that the further implementation and incorporation of the wider international human rights treaties will also have a significant effect. But so the incorporation of the CRC is the starting point, the springboard to a human rights respecting system across um, all of our public services. Now, Article 1 of the CRC very clearly has an exception um, around children who who um, are age 16 and 17 in Scotland and who may be defined as adults within other pieces of legislation. This is critically important within use to justice system responses to children in conflict with the law. Um, so that part of the of Article 1 has been redacted and the effect of that will be that there will be no excuses anymore. Children who are 16 and 17 must be given their full rights under the CRC moving forward and the, the necessary amendments in policy, practice and law will have to follow when we're talking about implementation. We're talking about implementation of the CRC in probably the autumn, October, November of this year. Um, because it's within six months of royal assent. So hopefully, fingers crossed, all going well, we'll have royal assent very soon within the next few weeks. That means that all of the public authorities, police, social work, health, education, uh, SCRA, justice systems, etc., will all have to be ready to ensure that their practices and policies align with the CRC to ensure compatibility. And we, as an office, we will be working very closely with civil society, with children and young people particularly, which is absolutely the best part of our job, um, to, to understand what that's going to look like in the future. Um, so the, I, I'm often asked what difference will incorporation make for children who are often the invisible children in our society who are in conflict with the law, particularly if they're being deprived of their liberty um, as a punishment for their behaviour. And Liz mentioned the children employment, the rapid numbers of children who are no longer being processed, dealt with and responded to through the adult criminal justice system. But within our office, we are, we are very, very confirmed I come firmly of the view of that that um, the children employment, 16 and 17 year olds employment should not be there. It is against international human rights law for them to be deprived of their liberty in an adult setting. Um, accordingly, those types of, of situations will have to be resolved, will have to be improved, and we will have to see legislative changes to allow that to happen. And as Colin highlighted, um, the work that's being done around ensuring that all children are being dealt with in a, in a welfare based approach will, will be um, hugely positive in understanding the operation of the children's hearing system. So in practical terms, there are still some areas of, of difficulty. The age of criminal responsibility has not yet increased to 12. Um, despite the enactment of the, the legislation last year, um, and that has not yet been brought into force. And so we have children who ostensibly can still be charged with offences under the age of 12 from the age of eight, um, simply unacceptable in an international um, uh, stage, on an international stage, particularly in light of the CRC. So I'm hopeful that the Commissioner's Office and the Commissioner himself um, will be able to offer some expert solutions, advice, support to the, how the implementation of the CRC will, will greatly improve the outcomes for children, taking account of all of this, the evidence and the data that we've been received, that we've received and we've heard from from each of our speakers today, but also from um, the wider community. Um, I had hoped to provide Isabella with a couple of, of um, documents and pieces of literature and research that we have been working on and using over the past year, but unfortunately I haven't been able to do that this morning. Um, but I just would like to mention a couple of things that happened pre-pandemic when all of these inequalities were in existence. We were all aware of them and then the impact of the pandemic 
and what that has meant um, since since afterwards. I'm very conscious of time, so it may be better if I um, share those with Isabella. Claire Lighthowler from the CYCJ um, prepared a report along at the same time as the Promise was launched. Um, and it was it was hugely helpful. It was called Rights Respecting Children in Conflict with the Law in Scotland. Um, so are we getting it right? It was very much a policy and legal paper. Um, and I think that looking at that, looking at the United Nations Global Study and looking at the United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child's general comment on child friendly justice, allow us to then say, well, what does that framework look like moving forward? Um, so I'd just like to finish by saying thank you. Huge thanks to everybody. I'm happy to answer any questions here or later on. Please don't hesitate to contact me. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Maria. That was really, really interesting and comprehensive and gave us um, what we feel needs to be done going forward and the importance of the UNCRC and what that might matter and uh, how that might matter for what happens in Scotland. That brings us on to the first question that I'm seeing in the chat box from Carol, which is saying, given the incorporation of UNCRC in Scotland, how do you envisage data being gathered and used to monitor the upholding of children's rights, given the current gaps in knowledge? So this is for um, everyone on the panel. Anyone like to jump in first? Perhaps Maria, this would be yours. I, I'm happy to jump in, but obviously, as you as you know, I'm not a data expert, um, and I'll defer to to the learned colleagues on the call. Um, essentially, it is an age-old problem. It is a it is a difficulty, and as Susan says, we are data rich in many ways in Scotland. But I think that that working together with with a single agenda. But what do we need to know? That age-old improvement question, isn't it? Um, what do we need to know, and how do we achieve that? So I, I'd really well welcome hearing from some of the academics around what they would would see that looking like. Thanks, Maria. Can I open that up to those who are involved in the use of data and the, the, the encouraging the government to collect and share data with us? I'm, I'm happy to come at this point, um, Morag, but um, but I should point out that although Morag is chairing today, she's probably a bigger expert in this area, uh, particularly in terms of children's data than anyone uh, else on the panel. Um, I, I mean, it's hugely important that when we are introducing new legislative frameworks and policy imperatives, that we have data that allows us to monitor the impact of those. If history tells us nothing else, it tells us that if we kind of blindly stumble along, you know, even when we have belief in the policies and we are uh, have a strong conviction that what we're doing is the right thing, sometimes there can be unintended consequences, which is why we end up with inequalities in the first place. So um, I, I'm not sure that I can answer Carol's question in terms of, uh, you know, what data will be gathered, but I, I would encourage there to be um, from from government, but from al also from other agencies, a much more open um, uh, perspective on sharing data and identifying what they want to learn themselves from that data so that we don't it's not just that we share data and we have lots of data sitting in these big dusty you know data warehouses we actually need to know what we're going to do with it and how it's going to benefit you know policy but also benefit the public how is it going to benefit children now to be collecting data about them um, I mean Morag knows um, that the uh, the data safe haven is um, is gradually trying to build up a huge um, store of administrative data uh, which will allow us to for example have a better understanding of children's pathways um, not just pathways to a single system like education for example and understanding more about how children's children progress in educational terms over time but also how their education links to their for example their justice journeys uh, another big area of research which is now being developed in England and Wales, huge piece of work linking um, Department for Education data to Ministry of Justice data and I'm afraid Scotland's starting to lag behind a bit in terms of some of the data that we're going to need to answer these questions. So uh, I'm, I haven't answered the question but I hope I've kind of demonstrated that we really do need to be engaging with the data agenda as well as the policy agenda. 
Thanks, Susan. I see Ben has his hand up, and that's excellent. I should have said that. If you can, because it's difficult, I can't see a whole screen of people the way I can sometimes on Teams or Zoom. So please do um, put your hand up if you'd like to speak. Ben, did you want to come in, or was that an accident? Uh, no, yes, uh, I will come in if that's all right. I think mo mostly just to ag agree with what Susan was saying. That, um, a fantastic question, Carol. I think in, in terms of so data for kind of research and monitoring purposes, the sort of separate issue for from data for kind of operational purposes, that a lot of the um, kind of technical barriers to data sharing, I think, have been solved or there are solutions available. And I think, um, as Susan said, Morag would know better than me, I think also a, a lot of the kind of the legal infrastructure for sort of data sharing, things like the Digital Economy Act are there. Um, but I think um, Maria really hit the nail on, on the head with with the, the question of what is it that we need to know that um, for, uh, in Carol's question, data being gathered and used to monitor the upholding of children's rights given the current gaps in knowledge, the, the first step has to be determining exactly what it is that we want to know and how we would measure the impact of incorporation of UNCRC. Um, and that sort of data itself uh, isn't necessarily the solution, it has to be the right data. Um, but uh, I think I would also agree with Susan that um, Morag knows way more about this than I do. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. Um, as the chair, I'm going to invite Liz, who has her hand up, to speak. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, just to echo echo the points that Ben and Susan have just just made. Um, that you know, we can have all the data in in the world and be able to gather that data, but we need to know what we're doing with it and why we're needing that data. Um, and I think we have we have made improvements in gathering data. There are still some gaps um, in the jigsaw that we need to kind of gather. Um, but we, we do need to then know what we're doing with that. And I think that's the next step. So certainly kind of within our, our kind of new vision um, for youth justice, which will be published in June, um, and the action plan that will follow from that, there will be an element of, of data um, needed within that um, work. So how, how do we, what gather data, data do we need to gather? Um, and what do we do with that data? Thanks, Liz. And Colin also has his hand up. Uh, more I just very quickly to come on in the back of what um, Liz has just said that I suppose there's two aspects. One is the data that we all we all know is challenging in terms of statistical information, and that's vital. And I think UNCRC probably presents an opportunity in that area for us to to maybe focus and to try and deliver what we need to try and deliver on that. But the other part is a bit more generic data and able to evidence compliance with UNCRC and how we demonstrate that to to young people in particular. That we're supporting them and we're looking after them. So I think there's probably two aspects, but I completely get the the bigger challenge is the statistical data that we, we we often crave and then fear when we can't produce. Thanks, Colin. And if I can throw my own tuppence worth in, um, working in children's data and working in the area of, of children's rights, um, I think traditionally too the the area of children's rights has not been one that has been terribly either um, focused on data, shall we say, with the, the Article 12 of the UNCRC is children's right to participation, right to be heard and right to be taken seriously. And that has been the one that has um, predominated quite rightly. Let's speak to children, let's listen to children, let's find out what children can tell us. And so it's been quite a qualitative movement, really, the children's rights movement. And it's now in a framework where we actually also have to work with the children's rights experts and the children and young people themselves to explore what are the indicators of their rights? How do their rights manifest in their lives before we can really talk about which data can then measure um, the upholding of those rights, if that makes sense. So that would be my tuppence worth it. Um, but as chair, I, I'm here to go on to the next question. We have one in the, the um, chat function from Richard um, is it Coben, and it's about the causation and the role of the police with these factors in each of the presentations. I wonder, would, it's a long question which I'm happy to read out, but I wonder if Richard would like to come on and speak and himself. I don't mind reading it out, just Richard, give me a wee steer what you would prefer. I, I I'm happy to uh, I'm happy to read it out or um or, or for you to go for it. I don't I don't mind. No, Richard, why don't you um, ask your question? I'm sure you make it more clear. Thanks. 
Oh, okay. Um, thank you very much, uh, Morag, and uh, hi to everyone. Um, so, yeah, my question is really just around sort of the the bit that ties together for for me um, the sort of the three main um, sort of uh, inputs, um, and that is that um, in the the sort of the, the causation and the role of the police in it. Um, the ACES factors in uh, in Catherine Babak's presentation were predominantly societal and public health things, um, and from what Susan said, it shows that. Um, that people in the CJ system have higher um, ACEs, um, and so and with Ben's presentation as well, it showed that there's um, that there's sort of causation there. So, the the sort of three parts to my question is first, as the ACEs are predominantly sort of societal, do the panel think that um, that the the sort of the, the crime elements and the, the the offending elements are they really just recycled symptoms as opposed to to causes? Um, second part of it is, if that's the case, should the focus, i.e., resources, funding, media, communications, how we, how we, uh, how the state and and when it speaks to society, should that focus be through alternatives to policing and through alternatives to the to the criminal justice system? Should it be dealt with um, as a sort of as a public health education and um, sort of social response as opposed to a criminal justice response? And so finally. Taking that that sort of continuum is uh, that traditionally the core role of the police is, is is crime and other things like missing persons and maintaining public order and so so on. So if in in developing policy off the back of this research, if we are really looking at what is ultimately a, a sort of a crime offending harm symptom to societal cause, um, what's the role of the police in that? Where where should the police be? Um, uh, in that conversation, should it be focused purely on that traditional role of crime investigation and so on, or um, should it be when it, within its um, dealing with children, as the Education Criminal Responsibility has been spoken about uh, already, as that is um, taking children away from the, the, the criminal justice system um, and it's more focused on sort of social work and, uh, and, and those sort of uh, uh, early, what is currently early and effective interventions for older children. Um, should that be the way we go? Should we reduce the, the police role? Police step away from that because it's um, it's considered uh, possibly that um, that that uh, that sort of contact with the criminal justice process causes further trauma and further harm. And if so, how do we then fill that 24/7 response gap where 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 children um, need that support? They need the response to whatever the harm is, whatever the incident is, and um, with the non-policing response. And then how do we also support um, the rights of victims? Um, because Whereas uh, it is it is harm and it is possibly done by by children, um, they're often still victims of crime. So it's a, it's a long and rambling question, which is why I chose to to type it out rather than <laughs> articulate it. Apologies for that, but hopefully I've, that has made sense. That does make sense. Thank you very much for your question, Richard. Um, I see that Babak has his hand up. Babak, is it this? Was, would you like to respond to this question? Oh yes, uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Richard. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah we can. Good. Yeah, that was very interesting. Uh, very interesting question. I can I can answer the first part of it only, but uh, I am happy to do so. As you rightly point, this is not uh, we don't have a kind of uh, uh, randomized experiment control or need any quasi kind of experiment to to uh, to claim that we have a causal. Uh, we kind of find a causal relation here. But we did series of uh, robustness check, and uh, to some extent, uh, we always find, uh, for example, significant effect uh, in in terms of parental maltreatment effect on offending behavior. We add uh, several uh, controls to the model. We introduce um, uh, controls, and also we consider a reverse causation probability by co only adding the kids uh, experience up to the age of 12 while the offending behavior was recorded in age of 12 so it's uh, this kind of exclude the possibility for reverse causation or the recycling things you were thinking of so we do think to some extent maybe we can claim that that is uh, that is kind of the, the, the show the kind of uh, causal effect from at this maternal or parental uh, um, maltreatments on on kids offending behavior. Uh, 
this is just the first part of your question. I leave the rest to, to others. Thank you so much for that interesting question. Thanks, Babak. I see Susan has her hand up. Susan, would you like to come in on this point? Yes, uh, thanks, Morag. Um, Richard, I think you've given us a, a topic for a whole other two-hour webinar there. Um, I'm, I'm not sure I can answer all of your questions in one, but they're such good questions because they get absolutely to the heart of, OK, you've just given us lots of research evidence. What do we do about it? And particularly from a policing perspective, um, I, I'm not sure I can answer all of those questions, but I, I would like to take, I've, I've actually copied your question down and I'll take it away and think about in terms of our next phase of research, whether we could actually tap into some of these things. Um, from the first question was around, you know, ACEs and is it is it causal? I mean, it's always really hard to disentangle one specific thing from everything else that happens in a child's life. And even though we have a lot of data from both the Edinburgh study and growing up in Scotland, you know, the, there, there's always things that it's hard to kind of disentangle the specific effect of one thing and from um, Kath and, and Babak's paper you know looking at the this kind of crude measure this is something Morag's talked about in her work this kind of crude notion of you know we just count up how many difficulties people have experienced and that that helps us to point to the kids that are going to have the worst outcomes and it's it 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 removes it takes away from that kind of the more qualitative elements of you may have a child that's only got one ace in, a, in terms of counting, but that adverse childhood experience could be parental, you know, sexual abuse. It could be some form of really terrible emotional abuse that is maybe the only thing that they have, but it's over a long extended period of time and gradually over time really wears that child down. So we need to understand more about what, what really, let's decompartmentalize what ACEs are and start to look at them individually and really understand, you know, what, what are the, the different aspects that will impact on different things um, and and my, I mean my paper I just I just went down the route of counting them up um, because I don't have the Felitti um, uh, scale or at least I didn't then but I do now I've measured it in adulthood um, and I, we're now looking at the impact of the, that kind of 10 point checklist um, and we're comparing it to what they told us when they were children um, and we've also measured adult um, adverse experiences because it's not just what happens in children in childhood it's all the things that start to kind of accumulate and lead to kind of problems later on so in terms of causes um, I think it, it's 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 never about kind of recycled symptoms it's always about the fact that you have once you once you have an individual who's got a kind of collection of problematic aspects in their lives they really struggle to shake those things off um, and I think perhaps from a, it's not the police's job to fix all of those problems, although increasingly it's the police that deal with those problems because these things knock on over into a mental health condition, which then leads to behavioural problems in a community or within a within a household in a domestic, you know, sphere, or it leads to addictions, which then spills over into behaviour in the community, which the police then deal with. So your, your question around what is the police role is, and, and is it about going back to good old fashioned crime investigation, that door has closed behind you long ago. You know, 80% of all the calls that come into the police are not about crime anymore. They are about these underlying social societal problems and vulnerabilities that, that fundamentally are embedded in um, difficulties that people experience in terms of their their individual upbringing and their their living environment um, it's about things that they experience because they live in poor conditions and suffer you know sometimes really terrible deprivation um, and it's sometimes and it's sometimes because we as a society still don't always deal very well with that because we see the symptoms morag's waving at me i've got your question richard and i'm going to take it away and get back to you <laughs> Richard, you get the prize for the question of the day, but we're, it is time to finish. But I really we have one more question from Sarah McGarrell that I would really like to ask um, if we could answer it very briefly. I don't want Sarah's question to go hanging. And what Sarah's saying is that good data and data sharing is very important, but so too is the experiential and biographical information that there is a lack of evidence from the perspectives of children in conflict with the law. And is there any intention to undertake um, future mixed methods and or in-depth qualitative research projects and also with the victims of youth offending, little mention of them in any data. 
Um, again, perhaps Susan, you'd be a good chance at this because you've also worked with victimization data. And sorry, Ben, I'll come back to you. <laughs> yes, I'll, I'll say a, a couple of quick things and then let Ben take over. No, I mean, Sarah's absolutely right. And, and today's presentation has been using quantitative data, but it's by no means intended to suggest that that's the only kind of data that's useful. Um, and, and of course, we need experiential and biographical information, which we collect a lot of. Um, for example, through the Edinburgh study. In fact, the, the latest phase at age 34 is, um, is going to involve a lot of qualitative data collection, and we've already done some of that. So um, yes, future mixed methods research is definitely the way to go, should always um, be carried out. And in terms of the victims, um, I struggle with the question about, you know, pitting victims on one side against offenders on the other because we find that there was such a close relationship between the two. Now, it doesn't mean that there are not some victims that aren't offenders. Of course, there are. It doesn't mean there aren't some offenders that don't say they've ever been experienced any kind of victimisation. They are they are a smaller group, I would say, than um, than victims um, who are not offenders. But uh, you know, we need to understand the relationship between both of those things, uh, in able to in, in order to properly understand it. Um, Ben's been doing a lot of work on victimisation and how that's changed over time, so he might want to mention that in his response. Super. Thanks so much, Susan. Last response goes to Ben. Would you like to come in and answer the question? Well, uh, yes, th thank you, Susan. Thank you, Morag. Uh, thank you, Sarah, for the great question. I agree with everything that Susan said. And I think one of the, the fantastic things in Scotland is that there are lots of people um, doing sort of di different kinds of work, sort of more qualitative experiential work um, with young people um, involved with the criminal justice system. So, yeah, I think our, our research programme kind of sits alongside all of these other things as well, for sure. As Susan mentioned, um, we've been doing some work looking at victimisation trends in Scotland by a bunch of different characteristics. And we it, it just to say that the victimization trends to some extent mirror what we've been discussing in terms of the falling numbers of um, young people coming through uh, in courts and through SCRA that there has the, the biggest drop in victimization across any of the demographic groups that we looked at um, was amongst uh, those aged 16 to 24. Um, so I, that might not exactly answer uh, your question Sarah in terms of victims of crime committed by young people but in terms of young people who are victims of crime which is Susan said often there's this this overlap that we have maybe seen a, a similar a similar kind of process and we focus today on the offending side of the side of the coin but um there is some evidence to suggest that there has also been a big drop in victimization for young people in Scotland. Thanks so much, Ben. Um, I feel we could easily go on and ask more questions. People start to get warmed up, don't they? And then some questions make you want to ask further questions. I, I would love to be able to ask more questions and respond to more questions, even though I'm supposed to just be the chair, because it's such a fascinating topic and so many different elements. But what I will do is I have to bring it to a close because it's one o'clock. And I'd just like to thank all of our speakers, all four speakers and all three respondents to the speakers today for a really insightful, fascinating, well-evidenced and thoughtful responses to the evidence that you've brought today um, on the subject of um, youth justice, poverty, structural inequalities, system contact and the adversity and trauma that children and young people experience. I'd like to thank everyone for um, coming today and for helping us too to inform future research. This is something that I'm sure the team will take away and talk about and work out what do we do next and how best do we do it next. So please do stay in touch and I'm sure the team will stay in touch with you. And I'd just like to close and thanks everyone. And thanks to the Understanding and Equalities team and to Susan and Isabella in particular for organising today. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank you. Thanks very much. Yep, yeah, and thank you to you, you, Morag, for being an excellent chair, as always. Bye, everyone. <laughs> bye, bye. Thanks, bye. Everyone, bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. 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 Thanks.